Hello, everyone. I'm Anita Cicero, Deputy Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And today, I will be your Master of Ceremonies for Event 201. On behalf of our center and our partners, the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our audience here in New York, as well as our larger virtual audience participating online today. The goal of the Event 201 exercise is to illustrate the potential consequences of a pandemic and the kinds of societal and economic challenges it would pose. The scenario also highlights the very critical role that global business and public-private partnerships play in preparing for and responding to pandemics. Today's scenario is going to simulate meetings of a multi-stakeholder group called the Pandemic Emergency Board. This board has been urgently convened by the World Economic Forum, and Johns Hopkins has been asked to moderate the board meetings and provide expertise during the board's deliberations. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. The board's recommendations are aimed at top decision makers in national governments, global business, and international organizations. In this scenario, Tom Inglesby, the director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, will be chairing the board and serving as the moderator for its discussions. Today's exercise will simulate four meetings of the Pandemic Emergency Board, and each meeting will be devoted to one key topic. Each meeting will start with a video and a briefing that will provide the information needed for the board members to engage. Please note, this is not a test of any particular person, organization, or nation. The participants are all playing as themselves. That is, senior business executives, NGO leaders, and government officials. They're not expected to be pandemic experts. We've really asked them to participate based on their own expertise and their best professional judgment. With the exception of Tom Minglesby, none of the participants know any of the details about how the exercise will unfold. The Event 201 scenario is fictional, but it's based on public health principles, epidemiologic modeling, and assessment of past outbreaks. In other words, we've created a pandemic that could realistically occur. And for those interested in our assumptions, we will have a lot of the background research and of the scenario publicly available on our Event 201 website at the conclusion of the exercise. The policy discussions, the challenges to be discussed in this exercise represent controversial high stakes issues that would require high level input from business and government leaders. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. For our in-person audience, please do silence all your electronic devices, but you may tweet at hashtag event 201. We're going to have a 15 minute break in the middle of the exercise, so please try to confine your calls and, and work to that time. Because the event is being video recorded and live streamed, we ask that you remain quiet as much as possible and avoid moving around during the exercise. The exercise is going to end at 1230 and there'll be a luncheon in the cotillion room to which you are all invited. As you know, there's also an online virtual event 201 exercise that's happening simultaneously. And for those of you online, um, and I understand there are hundreds of you, uh, you will be seeing the same news videos and briefings as we do here in New York. But you will engage in your own online discussion in, in place of watching the discussions of the players here in the room. The topics and the of the uh, the topics and the pacing of the deliberations will be the same, both online and in the room. So as you can see on this slide, uh, we have an outstanding group of global leaders playing the role of the Pandemic Emergency Board members here in New York. And with that, let's welcome our participants and invite them into the room. Tom Inglesby from Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, Latoya Abbott, Marriott International, Sophia, Sophia Borges, UN Foundation, Brad Conant, Henry Schein, 
Chris Elias, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tim Evans, formerly of the World Bank. George Gao from China CDC. Avril Haynes, former Deputy U.S. National Security Advisor. Jane Hulton, ANZ Bank, and former secretaries of both the Department of Health and Finance in Australia. Matthew Harrington from Edelman. Martin Knuckel from Lufthansa Group. Eduardo Martinez, UPS Foundation. Stephen Redd from USCDC. Adrian Thomas from Johnson & Johnson. And Hasti Taggi from NBC Universal Media. And Lavin Theroux from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Welcome. And before we begin the exercise, I also want to introduce Ryan Moorhard, who's lead of the Global Health Security Group at the World Economic Forum, and he will say a few words. Ryan. Thank you, Anita. And good morning and welcome again on behalf of the Center for Health Security, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the World Economic Forum. Welcome to event 201. 201. Throughout our session today, I hope that number will represent two dimensions of our work to strengthen global health security. First, today, there are 200 epidemic events every year, and it hasn't always been this way. The number is increasing, driven by globalization, climate change, urbanization, deforestation, and other trends of our modern world. In other words, we're in a new era of epidemic risk. And the second dimension is that one of these days, one of these epidemic events will be a pandemic, a fast-moving pandemic. And mitigating risk and impact of that pandemic will require an all-hands-on-deck approach. And we know from past responses that public-private cooperation will be essential. We also know from these responses that there are some bright spots when it comes to public-private cooperation, but some real critical challenges remain. But there's every reason for us to work together to address these challenges. For one, it turns out that at $570 billion annualized, the annualized risk posed by pandemics is uh, on par and rivals with climate change which means that the pandemic risk to lives and livelihoods is at a level that governments and the world's biggest businesses can no longer afford to ignore. And we are counting on this conversation today to inform our work together to improve our collective preparedness and to protect lives and livelihoods from pandemics. And to provide further context, I'm very pleased to introduce a short video now from Dr. Mike Ryan, the executive director at WHO and the head of WHO's emergency program. So with that, we'll turn to a video. Greetings, distinguished guests, and, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, say a few words at this year's event uh, 201. Uh, the high-level simulation exercise for pandemic preparedness and response, hosted by uh, John Hopkins Center for Health Security, the World Economic Forum, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to join you today. Um, I'm involved in the IHR Emergency Committee for Ebola, but I had hoped to be in the room with you, because the issues you will be dealing with over the next hours uh, may be tabletop exercises today, but they address real and critical threats which we at WHO take very seriously. Without a question, epidemic risk has become a global strategic concern. I don't think we've ever been in a situation where we have had to respond to so many health emergencies at once. This is a new normal. I don't expect the frequency of these epidemics to reduce, and in fact, vulnerabilities all over the world, developed and developing countries, have increased, not decreased driven by many, many factors, mainly uh, through human behavior, economic uh, development, uh, population density, uh, and many others. The scenario you will be presented with this morning could easily become one <clears throat> a shared reality uh, one day. 
I fully expect uh, that we will be confronted by a fast-moving, highly lethal pandemic of a respiratory pathogen. The question is, are we prepared to globally respond to the next major pandemic event? Are we ready to cooperate and perform across countries and across sectors to face such a threat? Have we established the surveillance and risk assessment systems, the communication tools, the supply chains uh, and the business continuity plans that will be needed not only to protect health in a major uh, epidemic or pandemic but to protect uh, economic development, to protect political and social systems. Um, do we collectively uh, drive innovation enough to face the evolving global threats which we are anticipating? The nature of pandemics is that many countries will be affected at the same time. This is particularly true with the respiratory pathogen, as they are often transmitted by asymptomatic persons. They spread fast. In 2009, the pandemic virus reached all continents in less than nine weeks. WHO's priorities are to establish a minimum capacity to detect and respond in each country around the world to develop global strategies for the containment and control of individual disease threats and develop global mechanisms to ensure cross-sectoral and multinational, multilateral coordination. Innovation and partnership across all sectors are needed, including, including joint strategies between global health leaders and the drivers of travel, communication, data technology industries. WHO is working at all levels through a variety of partnerships to strengthen national and regional preparedness such as GORN, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. Through the PIP framework uh, adopted by WHO member states in 2011, WHO has secured 400 million vaccine doses uh, for influenza, 10 million antiviral treatments and 250,000 diagnostic kits for the next pandemic. We have completed external evaluations of surveillance and response systems in over 100 countries and carried out more than 50 simulation exercises at country level looking for vulnerabilities and weaknesses in national systems. This voluntary, collaborative, multi-sectoral process helps countries to assess their capacities and identifies the most critical gaps within their health systems in order to prioritize opportunities for enhanced preparedness and response. The Pandemic Supply Chain Network, uh, part of the Epidemic Readiness Accelerator, which is a, uh, a project of the World Economic Forum in partnership with many, including WHO. It's a public-private collaboration to develop a globally connected supply chain that can support health emergency operations during a pandemic. Stakeholders consist of product manufacturers to logistics providers, distributors and UN partners, including ourselves. Uh, Michael Griffin uh, is uh, WHO's focal point for the Pandemic Supply Chain Network and he's there with you this week. Constant innovation and the use of cutting-edge technology is key to pandemic preparedness. In order to pool data and analytics at a global scale for disease prevention, the EpiBrain Initiative, a global data ecosystem, aims to build a collaboration of big data networks to understand and predict epidemics. It supports data science, innovation for outbreak preparedness and response. Despite this progress, there is still much to be done. Cross-sectoral simulation exercises, such as the one you will be experiencing today, contribute to a better understanding of the critical gaps, the cooperation required from global businesses, response decisions required from government and public health leaders to minimise large-scale economic and societal consequences of a severe pandemic. I wish you the best of luck, and we are looking forward to working with each of you to strengthen pandemic preparedness in the future. Thank you. And our thanks to, to Dr. Ryan. And, and with that, here in New York and online, welcome to Event 201. It began in healthy looking pigs, months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care, many died. At first, the spread was limited to those with close contacts, healthcare personnel, coworkers, and families, but now it's spreading rapidly throughout local communities. 
International travel has turned local epidemics into a pandemic spanning the globe. Just three months ago, CAP started in South America, but has now reached several countries with more than 30,000 cases and nearly 2,000 deaths. Good morning, and thank you all for being part of this Pandemic Emergency Board. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. <clears throat> the global community has been working to respond to this pandemic since its recognition. But as health and economic impacts have become more severe, the World Economic Forum has convened this board <clears throat> because of your combined expertise, your backgrounds, and your global voice. We will need all of you to help us respond to urgent policy crises that are emerging. The purpose of this board is to advise leaders in national governments, global business, and international organizations on the response to the pandemic, particularly focused on international problems that require collaboration between business and government. Your recommendations will be critical and will be promulgated and communicated broadly at the end of this meeting. On the left screen, as we have this meeting, you will find a dashboard of information about the pandemic that will help us in our conversations. As important background for this discussion, we want to start the meeting by viewing this news story that just aired on Global News Network. Continuing our coverage of the newly discovered CAPS disease and the scope of its deadly outbreaks. There are now more than 30,000 reported cases. Experts warn this may be just the beginning of a global problem. GNN science reporters have produced a video about what we know so far about CAPS, the virus, the outbreak, and the resulting chaos. CAPS is a novel coronavirus related to those viruses that caused the frightening SARS epidemic in 2003 and the deadly MERS outbreaks in recent years. Scientists think each infected person in turn infects on average two more people. This disease is proving more transmissible than SARS or MERS and about as contagious as influenza. Essentially, the cumulative number of cases is doubling every week. At this rate, we can expect to see 16 times as many cases in a month unless we find a way to interrupt transmission. The virus appears to be spreading rapidly in densely populated and impoverished neighborhoods in some megacities in South America. CAPS is a serious respiratory disease. More than half of the recognized cases have required hospital care, creating a huge strain on healthcare systems. The fatality rate is about 10%. For comparison, CAPS is about as lethal as SARS and two to four times more lethal than the 1918 influenza pandemic, the worst pandemic on record. Even so, some people only exhibit mild flu-like symptoms, not requiring treatment in a hospital. Alarmingly, those people are able to walk around and spread the virus, not realizing they are doing so. Even worse, international travelers have been arriving at their destination symptom-free, but within a matter of hours, becoming ill. Travel-related cases have blossomed into outbreaks in a number of locations and have quickly grown faster than health authorities could respond and contain them. In other places, physicians have quickly recognized the symptoms of CAPS and have been able to isolate infected individuals and avoid an outbreak, for now. Global public health experts are very concerned about this disease. Because it appears the virus is readily transmitted through the air from person to person, essentially all people are susceptible. Experts agree unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. Models developed by leading public health authorities indicate a CAPS pandemic could lead to an outcome worse than the 1918 influenza, which killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide. Given the global population is four times larger than it was in 1918, 
if these models prove accurate, we could be looking at hundreds of millions of deaths over the next year or two. Okay, now we're going to get a briefing on the numbers and distribution of cases by Dr. Caitlin Rivers. As you've just heard, the outbreak is very worrisome. The vast majority of cases are occurring in Brazil and other South American countries. However, as you can see on the screen, there have been some spread to Portugal, the continental United States, and mainly in China. Our models project that with continued spread in Latin America and predicted spread to additional countries, we could be looking at double the number of cases in one week and 16 times as many in a month if we are not able to stop the spread. That would be on the order of half a million cases and it would continue to rise exponentially. In three months, we could be approaching 10 million cases. We are also tracking financial markets as an indicator of the economic impacts of CAPS. While markets are down worldwide in the past couple of weeks, they are still positive for the year. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. The first emerging policy crisis for which we need this board's recommendations <clears throat> regards global allocation and distribution of medical countermeasures. And by medical countermeasures, we mean vaccines, drugs, and diagnostics and other medical supplies to help us combat the CAPS pandemic. I know we would all agree that if we had a vaccine in hand for CAPS, it'd be a game changer. But leading vaccine experts say a vaccine in the near term is highly unlikely. But there is an antiviral that does look like it will work. And to understand that better, we're gonna watch one more clip here. Continuing our CAPS disease coverage and possible solutions, I'm joined by immunologist Dr. Yubani Bello and Dr. Rhea Blakey, an epidemiologist, both highly respected in their fields. Let's get right to it. Why are people saying a vaccine for the CAPS virus is not likely in the near term? Researchers are working on a vaccine and we have viable leads, but it's complicated. We have known about CAPS-like viruses in animals and people for decades, but have not been successful at developing a licensed vaccine. And sure, there are new technologies that may help, but it's going to be difficult. I am not optimistic about having a vaccine in time to be relevant during this pandemic. Even if we discover a good vaccine candidate, we're starting from scratch, and it takes time to test safety and efficacy, typically years. So even if testing moves quickly, Global manufacturing will still need to be established. Again, multiple hurdles. We simply cannot rely on these old timelines and processes. This is a crisis. We have to move beyond these issues. It may be complicated, difficult, but if we dedicate all available resources, this can happen. Also, keep in mind, we need effective treatments sooner rather than later. Extronavir is an antiviral drug. Scientists have told me this could be effective. We need to start treating people immediately. While I agree, Extranavir does look promising. It's currently used for treating HIV. However, it's not manufactured on the scale needed for treating this many people. And will we just stop using it for HIV treatment? How will we get this drug in the quantities needed? Who decides who has priority for the limited amounts we do have? We both know countries are hoarding Extranavir. Doctor, in my opinion, you are lost in the details. With enough money and political will, anything is possible. Let's get going on this now. Thank you both for this extremely important discussion. Our U.S. affiliate has just released polling results on public expectations for a vaccine. A majority of Americans expect a vaccine to be available within two months, and 65% of those polled are eager to take the vaccine, even if it's experimental. In related news, a significant demand for personal protective equipment like N95 masks and gloves are on the rise due to the pandemic. However, globally, hospitals are running low. Additionally, other critical medical supplies such as saline and antibiotics are dwindling. Countries and companies are reportedly stockpiling supplies, disrupting healthcare supply chains, causing dangerous shortages in many parts of the world. And finally, for the latest information on what we know about vaccines and this antiviral, here's <clears throat> medical countermeasure expert Matt Watson. 
as we've just heard, there is no existing vaccine that appears effective against the newly discovered CAPS virus. Governments, scientists, and companies around the world have become working intensively to develop one, but it's highly unlikely that a vaccine could be developed, tested, manufactured, and distributed in less than a year, and it's likely to take much longer. While there have been efforts to develop vaccines against SARS and MERS coronaviruses, none have been licensed, and given the distinctions in the CAPS virus, vaccines against those diseases would not be effective for CAPS. The antiviral drug Extronavir has demonstrated some efficacy against the CAPS virus. It reduces the severity of illness and save, saves lives in those who are infected, but does not prevent infection like a vaccine would. Extronavir is a generic drug primarily used to treat HIV. It is manufactured in five countries, including the United States and China. Approximately one million people take Extronavir every day for HIV. If all of those HIV patients could be switched to other antiretroviral drugs, we could potentially free up enough extranovir to treat 26 million CAPS patients. Assuming further that we could double production over the course of a year by bringing additional manufacturing online, we could eventually have 52 million treatment courses per year, but it will take many months to get there. And there is not likely uh, ever to be enough to keep up with the need as long as the disease continues to spread at this accelerating rate. Experts agree that while many lives will be saved by this antiviral, there's, it is not going to slow the pandemic in the same way a vaccine uh, could if we had one available. However, we do have the potential capacity to save many people. Now the question is, how do we distribute the supplies we have? Existing global supply chains and logistics networks for Extranavir run efficiently under normal conditions, but the pandemic is likely to be very different. We are hearing that one country where Extranavir is produced is planning to block some or all of the export of this medicine to hold on to it for their own people. Tensions are rising between governments and pharmaceutical and medical supply companies about how supplies should be allocated and who gets to make those decisions. International humanitarian organizations are raising serious concerns about access to antivirals for people in low and middle income countries. In addition to antivirals, other medical supplies are not reaching those who need them in many parts of the world. This is especially pronounced in low and middle income countries, which are reporting the highest rates of disease transmission and mortality. In part, this is due to last minute stockpiling and hoarding by customers, and in part, it is due to cost and logistics issues. Personal protective equipment, such as N95 respirators, are in critical, critically short supply in some areas. N95 respirators are manufactured by many countries or companies around the world, um, but there are no reliable estimates of how many, are how many are produced or what global production surge capacity is. All we can say is that production capacity covers normal demand and it is not uncommon to have temporary shortages during severe flu seasons. In a severe pandemic, we can expect the need to increase by a factor of at least two to three. Given these supply issues, there are a number of potential proposals being floated aimed at coordinating and facilitating medical countermeasure allocation and delivery around the world. Politicians, business leaders, Scientists and policymakers are weighing in. Some, some are suggesting that suppliers and buyers continue to work independently to decide where to send antivirals and medical supplies. Others are suggesting that countries where these products are made should be able to decide where those drugs and supplies go. Still others are recommending that suppliers, buyers, and countries entrust a central international entity or organization with the job of allocation and distribution decisions for at least a portion of antivirals and other medical supplies. Thank you, Mr. Watson. So the policy crisis in question for this board in this meeting is this. How should governments, business, and international organizations allocate and distribute pandemic antivirals and medical supplies to the people who need them most? We now have time for discussion about this matter. This is the focus of this meeting. Any reactions? We have too few antivirals 
for the needs that we have, and we're projecting to have increasing needs. So should we let normal suppliers and buyers manage the, manage the distribution and allocation of this medication? Should government step in? If so, with what rules? Steve? Yeah, let, me, let me start by saying um, it is um, fantastic how much has been learned about this disease in just the short period of time mm -hmm. since its discovery. Um, I think one issue that um, hasn't yet been explored is um, what could be done to uh, suppress transmission apart from the use of countermeasures. And so I think that's something that needs to be an active area of study. Learning yes. where uh, transmission is occurring would be helpful in order to implement measures that don't require um, uh, medicines to suppress transmission. Maybe uh, hospital settings, school settings, or yes. places where transmission could be occurring. Um, with regards to the question of um, sharing this uh, scarce resource, uh, we do have some models that I think could be, um, could be built upon. Um, the PIP framework, the um, things that were done during H1N1 to, uh, to share vaccine, I think each of those, uh, those models should be explored uh, as uh, ways of uh, some sort of distribution process. One, one of the specific things that was done during H1N1 was to examine the um, critical uh, individuals in countries as a, as a sort of a minimum level of countermeasure that would be needed and to So do you think mean critical how, infrastructure? Exactly. You mean critical infrastructure right. in countries um, going? Security, um, okay. police, fire, you know, what, what number of treatment courses, you know, if we had uh, enough to share, okay. what, would that, what would that minimum number be just as a starting okay. point for negotiation? Great, Adrian. And then I think, I think before we <clears throat> before we um, agree that we have a finite resource, we need to really challenge ourselves on the vaccine production. We've seen historically that we can actually produce an Ebola vaccine in a year. Um, it requires flexibility on the regulatory side. It requires commitment from companies. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that before we say that a okay. vaccine is not available, we should not slow down on that. We should pursue yes. that. And I think similarly, we need to ex explore how could we accelerate production of our anti, uh, antivirals. We've seen it happen before in the HIV crisis. It's possible, but decisions need to be made and we need to bring the right people together to do that. Okay, and for the moment, before we are able to accelerate production of the antiviral, do you have any initial reaction since you are potentially one of the companies that could be part of this deliberation? What we've seen work uh, very well in the HIV field is in fact procurement through the Global Fund. So having a centralized mechanism, so financial, financially able to procure on behalf of affected countries okay. would be critical. I think the second thing, the second thing is um, it's going to be very important that for the business sector, for manufacturers of anti antivirals, that we have clarity around what the need is and where the need is and who are making the decisions. So who's deciding on where they're yeah. going? Okay. So, so can I add to that? Yes. So one of the challenges we have is what to do in the really short term about the supply of vaccines, antivirals, etc. Because low to middle income countries will be concerned that the entire supply chain will be tied up by the time they can even figure out how to finance uh, their purchases. We know, and we know this from what happened with H1N1, that if you can stop something early in terms of everything from ring fencing in particular countries, but also to look at the transmission from country to country. And there's a variety of measures that can be taken to do that. But unless that is done in a global context and it's done very early, we will end up with a situation where the entire supply chain will have gone. So what we need to do at the very outset is figure out what the likely route of transmission is and move very quickly to secure supplies and distribute supplies according to whatever epidemiological protocol we, and based on what Steve says, as we know, <coughs> we already know some things about the transmission of this disease. But unless we do that whilst doing what we can do on vaccine, I agree, um, we will have this get out of control. Okay, Tim. I agree with you. Yeah, we'll think, go down the line. Um, it's important and it's, it's <clears throat> fantastic to have this information in front of us because if you look across the countries, you've got very different uh, patterns already. Chile seems to have a 3% case fatality rate, Ecuador a 5%. So what's going on there? And are there lessons in terms of how they're managing the outbreak, uh, which might inform ways in which you're going to decrease the need 
um, for scarce resources? Are they more effective at, um, in their supportive treatment? Uh, or what is it that's explaining what look to be significantly different patterns mm -hmm. in the outbreak mm -hmm. of the epidemic? Uh, the second point is that um, these are all middle-income countries or high-income countries. And uh, as, as Jane mentioned, uh, low-income countries are either their surveillance systems aren't sensitive enough to detect cases that are already there, uh, or um, are worried that, in fact, um, uh, they will be uh, at the bottom of the food chain. Uh, and in this respect, uh, the World Bank uh, would probably be proactively um, moving into exercising what we call a CERC, uh, which is a contingency emergency response component to existing loans to low and middle income countries in which they can repurpose those loans for uh, these types of emergencies. So I think on the financing side, uh, the CERCs, uh, which are, are built into every loan uh, made uh, by the bank, could be exercised okay. in such a way that um, uh, you don't have the problem of the lack of resources being the primary constraint uh, for the purchase of um, uh, those uh, scarce Enterprise. commodities. Okay, Latoya? I agree, I agree, because <clears throat> financially, that's one of the things we'll have to look at. We have to have the financial means to start production, mass production, and getting companies on board. It's about buy-in and having an understanding of where we're moving forward with this disease process, how quickly and rapidly it's, it's uh, proliferating, and also utilizing the materials that we do know, like the protective equipment that we already have. We know it's airborne, so ensuring that companies that are manufacturing these products have their financial uh, have the financial ability to be able to do such. So that way, even if we are in the process of continuing to um, you know, develop this drug, there is some type of protection that's going on to the lower, okay. lower company. Okay, great. So I'm gonna keep going down the line, but uh, just in terms of the initial reactions, do we think, as Adrian suggested, that there should be some kind of international uh, resource or distribution method, or really are we, is this, is this going to be every country for itself <clears throat> doing what it can to procure yeah. N95 masks, antivirals for itself? And so uh, just think about that as you're making your comments. Yeah. Well, I do think that there needs to be a, sort of an honest broker, a centralized command and control uh, organization that really brings together the public private sector, both on a global approach and also on a local approach because we can't forget uh, that transparency and communications at the local level are gonna be critical in the continued, to, to stop the continued spread. But, but I do think there needs to be some form of centralized approach to really organize all the various efforts that are gonna be undertaken. Okay, I think a lot of people wanna get in here. Uh, uh, we'll go around the table, Martin, Sophia. Chris and then George. Thank you. I fully support the centralized approach in this state we have already. Uh, if it comes also to global distribution of any products. And I would like to go back to uh, Stephen's first statement. We have parallel to this. We should really focus on how the spread could be controlled better or easily. If I talk about logistics for, for uh, globally distributed topics, we need to protect the staff that is responsible for this. If they don't protect it, they won't do this. And then the entire chain breaks apart within no days. So we really have to do it bo both parallel to find out possible ways to protect the people that are in chain for this, and it should be centralized, uh, organized, otherwise it will not, not work. So you're saying that the people who are delivering these medicines and moving them around the world, they should be protected yes. by these medicines? Yes. I mean, there's okay. there basic protection anyway in a phase like this, but uh, we should enlarge this with the newest uh, information we have about spreading. Only with this, we can guarantee that any, any uh, distribution is, a po is a possible at all. Okay, Sophia? Thank you, yes, I agree, and I wanted to speak to the point about having the honest broken. I think in this regard, the United Nations fits the bill. Um, I think that given that uh, the countries most affected are those that are low and middle income countries with unequal access to technology, to, to finances, uh, the UN has a, a worldwide uh, footprint, universally uh, recognized and uh, universal membership. And I think 
taking the example of the Ebola crisis uh, last round when a trust fund was uh, established and calling on member states who are capable of contributing to that trust fund in order to help those that are least capable, uh, the low and middle income countries. Thank you. Chris? Uh, thanks, Tom. I, I, I want to agree with a couple of the comments. One is about the need to prioritize for the, the basic, the frontline health workers, the, the basic people to keep the system working. I, I think it's important to recognize that we have the data that you're showing because of some remarkable international collaboration about sharing information in real time about the patterns of disease. And that's come out of the international <coughs> health regulations, and that's a good first step. If we're now going to try to prioritize the allocation of scarce commodities, having this kind of dashboard to know where those masks and drugs are and, and to, to get at some of the psychology that's behind some of the hoarding. People may be making bad decisions because they, they think it's more scarce than it actually is. So if we could have the equivalent of this dashboard to understand where the supplies are to map to the needs, a global stockpile would certainly help ensure more rational and strategic allocation. But the reality is that we don't have the logistics capability, even within the UN, to bring that together in one place and run it. So this is where I think a collaboration between the international organizations like the World Health <laughs> Organization and the private sector, which runs these supply chains for many purposes every day, understand where the supplies are, make smart decisions about how to allocate them to the people who need them in the places that need them the most, and then work with the industry to move those supplies from where they are today to where they need to be. On your point of transparency and data about where supplies are, where medicines are, where N95 masks are, we couldn't agree more. We, we've been unable to find that data, so I think it's an important need that you just surfaced. George? Yes, I would uh, support for the proposal of you know, centralized co coordinated efforts, not just national, also internationally. You know, uh, at such a situation, that's very, very, very important. And when you read all this uh, about EPI ep data, R0 is two. You know, it's relatively, you can see the number is there. Especially when you are talking about some country like China or any countries who have the largest population of the swine, peak production. So if the virus yet still, you know, transmitted from peak, peak still in the cycle. So that could be very serious. So we have to pr prioritize. So maybe the farmers or whoever have access to it. So that's very important to have the expert to, accept, to assess. The possibility, you see the R0, but you also see it's swine origin. I will still have some new virus from swine, from pigs, or the virus already circulated in the human beings. That's also, we should put that into account for the strategy for the allocation of the um, extra vena. And also, I got the information from my staff. Looks like, of course, you know, we have capacity to produce the extra nerve, but uh, even you know, think about the population we have. We, we can't plan our uh, capacity. But you know the, what we have, even not enough for our own population. Tom. That's the question we should take. Yes, I think I think it's important in 2019 to remember uh, that in 2016, uh, the World Economic Forum, together with the World Food Program, mm -hmm. presented a global supply chain management approach for this exact scenario. And what might be helpful, given that everybody suffers from. Uh, short-term memory deficit is to have an emergency briefing on those resources that are global public goods that are there to s facilitate uh, supply chain uh, management and where, where those can be deployed. But also um, CEPI, uh, which was uh, established three years ago uh, at, to accelerate vaccines exactly in development in these settings where a coronavirus is, in fact, one of its indications and first uh, areas of focus, um, that may not be common knowledge. Likewise, on the financing, uh, there is global financing. Uh, the criteria identified here would be triggers for the pandemic emergency financing facility, which would disperse a significant mm -hmm. amount of money into that international pool uh, on the basis of this trajectory of the epidemic. So those are resources that uh, may not be well understood amongst the set of players that would appreciate having some understanding. So an emergency briefing on those resources, I think, might make sure that they're not overlooked. Kosti, and then Matt. So a couple of things. First of all, the patients who are currently on Extranavir need to receive different medications. So I think this is something that the team needs to 
look into how do we make sure that we have the right resources to make sure that they're not uh, being panicked and uh, we're not causing panic with them and, and that we're having to use this drug for a different use um, at this time. Secondly, I think it's very important that we make sure that there is concise communication with all healthcare facilities where these patients are being treated so that there isn't mass panic. And perhaps a member of this team could be part of that task force to ensure that whether it's um, in the news, by social media, or to these hospitals, we have the right communications channel to be able to um, make sure that the public does not have uh, mass panic. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Yeah. I was just going to, uh, I'll add to that in as much as the value of a centralized convening body um, that is addressing both the production uh, and supply chain also serves as a convening enterprise around the communications. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there is a lot of great data that's been collected, but probably more can be done from a public education perspective mm -hmm. around containment prevention um, while the supply chain is managed. Ivan? I just want to echo Matt's uh, point. And my question here is, uh, what's, what's happening around the world? While you know, we know that there are cases here in these few countries, what's happening to the rest of Asia? What are governments doing? to assure the people, and this will help to relax some of the stress that you see in terms of people hoarding uh, personal protection equipment. So I think it requires uh, a global coordination and not just at the individual country specific level. Yeah, Brad? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on Christopher's uh, scarcity comment. Uh, it's not just scarcity, it's also severity, and that's why we see different rates of, of fatalities, 5% to 3%. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a stakeholder maybe missing here, and I may be wrong, but um, is the provider. And who's taking care of these patients? Because there's, there's definitely discrepancies here on, on fatality rates. Um, we know in, in, in panic, in psychology of panic, um, people start hoarding. People start you know, freaking out and wondering, <laughs> what, what should I do? And, and then countries start doing it, and then there's all kinds of uh, dysfunctional decisions made. Um, providers really need to be at the table uh, talking about how they're taking care of the patients um, and, and diagnostics and what they're doing with it because uh, we're, we're jumping to a little bit of a conclusion that this is going to spread everywhere to <coughs> the same degree. Um, and this leads to hoarding. And, I, and I'll, I'll share with you the, the in SARS, SARS uh, N95s, there's still N95 sitting in boxes um, yeah. that were never used. I mean, mm -hmm. the hoarding of that was, was atrocious. I mean, and, and, and then there were knockoffs of N95s that really weren't truly impervious masks mm -hmm. that were made and then, and, and then distributed. <coughs> so I, I, think there's, um, I think there's a need to have the providers in the discussion to see really what they're doing to treat the patients. How okay. severe is the, the, the academic? So just on severity, it's important for you all to know that our, <coughs> the, the, estimate from our team and from other ministries of health is that the distinctions in case fatality rate represent distinctions in data collection, uh, not that the disease is any different. The, it looks like the virus is the same around the world. These are different healthcare systems, different data collection, different surveillance. So overall, our all-in case fatality rate is somewhere in the order of 7% to 10%. It depends on where we are in the world. And in terms of where the disease is in the world, we see lots of blank spots, and we think that's partly or largely due to surveillance systems and the slowness in collecting this data in certain parts of the world. We expect that to come online quickly. Absolutely. Steve, and then or Avril, you haven't had a chance. No, Steve. Go ahead, I think you haven't had a chance. Okay, sure. I, I mean, I think it's just in terms of the precise question being asked, it's clear that uh, having everybody go with, on their own is not going to be the most effective answer, right? So I absolutely agree with the comments that have been made that we need to have some kind of international mechanism for coordinating what it is that we would be doing, also for collecting information, also for understanding what the resources are that are available through international mechanisms to execute on that allocation and coordination. I think it's challenging to set it up in a way that says that international mechanism has to be the body that decides in all circumstances what the allocation is. In other words, I think states are going to want to be able to decide for themselves on, in some circumstances some of the issues that are relevant. So one of the challenges will be ensuring that you're using an existing mechanism, and I think Sophia's right about the UN as being sort of the base of operations in a sense, um, both for the funding but also for a whole series of other issues that you would be looking at for allocation, coordination, et cetera. But then making sure that states are stepping up to actually tell people what it is that they're doing, what their decisions are in that context, and creating transparency about what the proper allocation should be for containing this issue so that there can be pressure put to bear on ensuring that states are actually doing what the larger plan needs to be in that context. 
Can I ask a follow-up question? If there, if there is a centralized stockpile developed, either at the WHO or perhaps somewhere else in the UN system, if you were <laughs> going to suggest that, or some other entity, how much can you imagine states contributing of the supplies that are being made in their own countries? Is this a 1% allocation, 20% of the supply that they're making? We've already heard from George that China is not making nearly enough medication to take care of China at this point. So what is the desired end state here? Can you, from a, from a state security perspective, if someone who's worked at the top of government, what do you imagine states who have this medication doing? I mean, I think the percentage will depend on the details, right, and mm -hmm. what it is that you're capable of actually producing in the context of the particular crisis. But, and I don't know how much we're able to produce under this circumstance. I think there should be and there would be from a public perspective and a public health perspective, right, enormous uh, interest in promoting an allocation to international efforts um, that would actually contain the issue as quickly as possible, right? And that should be the focus for everybody in the sense of that's what's gonna actually help you prevent the downstream impact of what the trajectory holds for us. So uh, the question is, can you, through this international mechanism, really promote commitments mm -hmm. to doing this as quickly as possible and give people a sense that actually if they contribute more, that they will have a, a better chance of protecting their own populations and their country's security. Okay. Another number of comments. You all just jump in. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, so, to be completely clear, most uh, of this production would already be committed in contracts. Yes. Uh, it is almost unheard of that people are producing product without having a forward commitment for the consumption of that product. So, the first thing that needs to be done, because this is not something that the countries currently control, unless countries are going to bring about emergency situations and co opt an existing supply chain. So the first thing to do is to figure out where that's going. Now, in H1N1, uh, in a number of cases, so the Australian government, we bought vaccine to the extent we could get it. And in some instances, we actually gave some of that vaccine. We actually gave some of that vaccine to the United States who actually ended up with a supply shortage at that particular point. So inconsistent we is, uh, working out where the biggest vulnerabilities are, the first thing you need to do is figure out who's got control of those supply chains and those products, and then figure out where for the greater global good it should be deployed. But we need to be clear, any government who says, I'm gonna ship every single dose of a particular product offshore is going to end up with a challenge domestically. Mm -hmm. So m giving governments the capacity to manage both their domestic mm -hmm. concerns together with being good players. And we know from the PIP framework that companies will similarly contribute, but it's <coughs> got to be in an organized framework. Okay. And, and that bad. challenge, I think, is being proved out with the increasing <coughs> rhetoric, both by candidates in the US, UK, and Germany, who are saying that globalism is responsible for this pandemic and therefore there's a rising protectionist nature um, to take care of their own. Um, and so I think it's an instance where the business, health, and scientific communities need to uh, combat that rising uh, rhetoric and misleading information. Yeah, and last so, couple of comments um, here. We have about two minutes before we have to close. So I think one thing that's gonna be very important is to uh, define the aim of mm -hmm. using the countermeasure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from what we know right now, it doesn't seem likely from the data we've had presented that this countermeasure is going to suppress transmission, is going to lead to containment. So yes. our aim really would be to um, minimize the severe severity and to prevent death rather than to prevent the, the you know this emerging pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, second thing I wanted to say is just how important communication is, and that is true to the public. This is a very alarming situation, and I think public communication sh shouldn't be alarming, but should be truthful about how severe it is. I think also internally, um, as negotiations are going on to, uh, to share countermeasures, um, it, I think it's not likely, I agree, that, that countries are not going to buy, uh, buy a countermeasure to put into a global supply without retaining a large portion of it for themselves. Um, the last thing I'd say is this is a very dynamic situation. Countries will be negotiating with manufacturers, and I think that's got to be figured into whatever agreement is reached. And whatever that sharing agreement is, it won't be perfect. And I think we shouldn't, it's just got to be done quickly so that sharing can actually take place rather than trying to get something that's exactly the way everyone wants it. And do you think that governments are going to need to break contracts 
have companies break contracts in order to redirect antivirals? Um, I, I think that that would work best for the countries to make the decisions with uh -huh. the countermeasures that they purchased. Okay. So I think that's a very, you know, from a, we're not talking about one supply chain, but we have multiple supply chains here. And I think, you know, before we start uh, talking about companies uh, withdrawing antiretrovirals from patients with HIV who have a disease, we need to really understand how, how those ARVs will be used in patients who may or may not have a disease. So demand forecasting will be critical. And I also want to point out that it's not just the, the, uh, the healthcare workers. You know, we have supply chains in middle-income countries. Often those are very um, resource-dense, people in small spaces producing masks. We have to think about the integrity and the health of the supply chain. Okay. Uh, uh, going back yes. to Stephen's note real quick uh, about the public uh, communication, my team has been monitoring the public response. Um, and on various social media channels and cable networks, there has been uh, some conspiracy theories that are around about uh, the potential that pharmaceutical companies or the UN have released this for their own benefit. So as we move forward, obviously trust in pharmaceuticals and government is very important at this moment. And so as we okay. move forward uh, with developing the right um, scenarios, we have to make sure that the public communication is a, is a major part of that because of these conspiracy theories. Thank you. We have to close. I'll give you, we have 30 seconds. Okay, yeah, but this fully supports Steve's input. Uh, we should not search for the perfect solution right now. Yeah. We, we, we run against time. And if conspiracy theories like this come up already, so we are on the edge of hysterical reactions, and then it gets out of control. And that's the thing what should be the main driver for us now to find a solution. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We're going to bring these recommendations uh, together and communicate them broadly at the conclusion of this meeting. Thank you all for your input. We will conclude this meeting, and we'll reconvene shortly. Yes, and that does conclude the first meeting of the board.